Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm not going to introduce myself because that was very well done. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so I'm here to talk about uh, our Sleepy Hollow uh, VR uh, experience and uh, narrative in VR. Uh, so I'm going to start right into this. Um, so late 2013, uh, we had just opened up our office in Los Angeles, and we were looking to pursue opportunities uh, to pitch to um, studios for television and film in Hollywood. And we had this opportunity to pitch to Fox, uh, who were looking to promote the second season of their hit show, Sleepy Hollow, which had just finished, and, um, and it, was, it was kind of like a runaway hit for them. Uh, so we had this idea, and we wanted to pitch them VR. Uh, which at the time was an extremely nascent technology. Uh, and how nascent was it? Well, at that point, there were still many Kickstarter backers who had not received their DK1s. Uh, we were eight months away from the release of DK2, uh, a year out from the launch of the first Gear VR, uh, and Facebook and Google weren't even mentioned yet. And also, um, most people really didn't understand what an Oculus Rift was. Uh, we got a lot of confused looks from people uh, and some really bizarre answers at some time. So. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Secret Location. Uh, actually, one slide about Secret Location. Uh, we're a content studio for emerging platforms. So what that means is that we like to work with story, and we like to work with new technology. Uh, so uh, in VR, we had our emerging platform, uh, but the big question was, uh, what's the secret to telling a good story in VR? And we had no idea. Um, so there was not a lot of readily available info on the VR process at the time. Uh, actually, when we went online to ask people questions, we found uh, that there were no answers. There were just people with either the same question or nobody was having the same question at, as us. Uh, so we had to experiment. And after brainstorming and experimenting and prototyping, uh, we started to come up with an approach uh, towards narrative. And uh, what we decided to do uh, was that we would use a sound and action cues to direct the user's attention towards a primary story area. Um, this sort of was to combat the 360 uh, field of view for VR. Uh, we would place points of interest outside of that um, focal area to add context to the active narrative. And then we would develop some kind of dynamically generated content uh, that could be delivered to the user in a predictable way. So if there was anything that we really wanted the user to see, we could make it so that they would see it no matter what. Uh, so I'm going to talk about these. The first one being uh, acclim acclimation and leading action. So the idea of uh, letting the or, uh, users or the audience um, orient themselves in VR, and then the subtle prompts that would guide their um, uh, attention. So pacing the story, this is your basic uh, 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 pacing for a, a story. You'll notice it's, it's not really any different from something that is linear uh, on television or in a book or whatever. It's like the five-act structure. Uh, but we knew that the introduction, the uh, acclimation period, had to be a little bit longer because this was going to be a lot of people's first uh, experience with virtual reality. And when you put people into VR for the first time, obviously they, they tend to look around, they tend to want to see what the world is like. So rather than having them miss the beginning of the story, we wanted to give them that time to look around, and then we wanted to have some kind of leading action, which is the uh, audio cues and movement cues, to, to gently guide their attention towards where the story was going to take place. So this acclimation period is really essential right now. Um, it lets people gradually ground themselves in the environment. Um, as the medium matures and as people get more and more experience in VR, we believe that this time will actually become less necessary. Um, it's still going to be there to the point where you don't want to just be teleported somewhere and have no idea where you are or what your surroundings are. It's really unnerving to us as a species because we're not used to just being able to teleport. Um, but yeah, it's something that we're going to have to keep doing. But then the question is, is, if you're letting people look around, you're letting them take in the environment, how do, how do you get their um, attention back to the story? And you can do this in, in a lot of ways, and some of them are a lot more overt than others. One of the problems that we have is that uh, cinematography tends to break in a frameless format. So by frameless, I mean a 360 environment. You don't have edges of a screen, uh, and we can't really rely on the tools that we use to tell stories in movies and on television. Uh, because a lot of our visual language really depends on these defined edges of the screen. So for Sleepy, um, what we did is we have this little guy, our little crow. It's kind of hard to see. It's a dark dark uh, panel. But um, we have this crow on top of a, of a tombstone, uh, and he actually flies off towards where uh, Ichabod Crane, our main character, comes in. 
Um, so that motion that sort of is, if, you, if the crow is in the audience's field of view, they'll follow it and then they'll, they won't miss the beginning of the story. But of course then the issue is, what if they're not looking at the crow? Uh, so we, we paired that motion, that motion cue with an audio cue. And obviously um, audio cues, uh, sound is omnidirectional. So when you're in a VR uh, environment, you may not be looking at something and getting that visual cue, but you're, uh, you are getting that audio cue. Uh, so using audio to, to support the motion extends that reach even further. So even if they're not looking in the direction of the crow, they can hear the crow cawing behind them, and then when they turn around to see what it is, the crow flies off, and then the story starts. Um, so we've actually moved away from using this kind of an overt guidance, and we're trying to use it much more subtler, uh, because when you employ this with a heavy hand, it, it starts to feel very forced, uh, and pun, pun not really intended with a heavy handed, but... Um, so the idea is that um, we try to be subtle, we try to be clandestine with it, but what if it's too subtle? What if the audience refuses to pay attention to the primary story area? Uh, well, then you still want them to have a, 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 like sort of a degraded experience that still is meaningful and is still rewarding. So we use these secondary points of interest. So again, we're talking about a frameless uh, experience. Uh, which gives you a, a 360 degrees of freedom, and this is often considered to be the greatest stumbling block uh, in, in narrative in VR. So the first thing that we wanted to do was develop a way that we could plan for this, we could plan uh, like a, a 360 storyboard, which is what we, we built. So we planned out the entire environment of Sleepy Hollow in this, uh, in this storyboard, uh, which would not, was not only used for um, modeling, letting the, uh, the modelers and the artists create the environment, but we also used it to sort of plan out where items were placed and what they were doing and, and how they would be rewarding to the user if they weren't watching the main experience. Um, and again, so making that environment relevant to the story and rewarding is really important. So in Sleepy Hollow, what we did was there's things in the scene like uh, uh, other characters' tombstones, there's Easter eggs from the third season, which some people picked up on when they went through the experience. Uh, and, then, and so that sort of on one hand rewards the user and on the other hand uh, makes it relevant to the story. Uh, and the good news about this is that anything that's sort of in a, as a point of interest isn't um, imperative content. So if it's missed, it doesn't affect the story. But if you decide not to look at the main story area, you're still getting some kind of visual story while you're getting the audio. And the audio comes from, obviously, Ichabod. He's never out of earshot. The story isn't missed. Um, and he can still, you can still get the story through watching the environment and hearing what he has to say. But of course, then there's parts of the story that you just have to author. You want the user to see them. And that's where the dynamically generated content comes in. Uh, so at this point, this is something that you have to do using real-time rendering. Uh, game engines like Unity or Unreal, which other people have talked about today. Uh, and what it allows you to do as an author is to have crucial information that is presented to the audience based on where they are looking. Uh, so in... Um, so the, the digital interactive nature of VR allows us to use these techniques that aren't afforded to film. Uh, so for us, th that happens to be the, uh, the climax of the story when uh, the horseman cuts off your head. Uh, sorry if you haven't gone through the experience yet, uh, but it is called Sleepy Hollow, so you should figure that there's going to be some heads getting cut off. Um, so we knew that this we needed the, the user to see the horseman come at you before he cuts your head off, because when we didn't have that at, at first and people missed it, they didn't understand why their head was, they didn't, like, because their view changes when their head topples off. <laughs> so people didn't really understand what was happening or why, um, and then we realized we need to make it so that this horseman comes at you. So the problem that we were running into was that he has to appear, and having a, a, a headless person appear in front of you is somewhat unnerving, uh, and doesn't really make much sense in the world. So uh, we used a little bit of a misdirect, and we have this, this jump scare in the form of a a swarm of bats. Uh, again, sorry if you haven't gone through the experience, there's a swarm of bats, it scares you. Um, it's the bat smoke screen or the bat screen, uh, and it obfuscates the horseman's arrival. It sort of happens and it completely covers, covers the scene at one point, which allows us to have the horseman pop into existence right in front of you, and then he comes through the bats and, uh, and he chops your head off. And uh, that's sort of the climax. So this, is, this sounds great. We were like, really happy with how this turned out. And we said, well, why don't we do this with all the characters? Um, well, obviously, uh, Tom Meissen was shot uh, stereoscopically on a green screen. Uh, this allowed us to get 
the, the best possible performance and the best looking um, model of him. You can actually see emotion in his face. The acting comes through. It's not a 3D model. But we're limited. Um, we were able to get him into a 3D environment, but we, um, uh, we weren't able to manipulate him or we couldn't let the, the audience move in any way because it would break the stereoscopic uh, performance. And just another example of how nascent this technology was, uh, we actually had to build our own stereoscopic 3D rig because the professional cameras uh, that were available at the time were A, expensive, and B, were designed for um, like widescreen. So you couldn't get a, a full body shot uh, unless you were 15 feet away or more. And when you shoot stereoscopically, the distance that your subject is from the camera when you shoot is the distance they will be in VR. And it just made Tom Meissen, like this tiny little guy off in the distance, sort of shouting at you, which is really not rewarding. Uh, Steph mentioned earlier that um, the closer things are to you, the more rewarding they are, and it's, it's totally true. Um, so yeah, it was, it was interesting because we were able to, to capture that, that live performance and put it into a 3D environment with other 3D characters. Um, and because the horseman was a CG character, we could animate his approach and then apply that based on where the audience is looking. Uh, and then uh, that was a, a way for the audience to actually have agency in the world, but indirectly, and their behaviors and actions uh, impact the story, but very discreetly. Uh, so it's interesting because we don't have to actually pause the story and make demands for input. There's no real, like, like the user's not aware that they are doing this. It just sort of happens. Uh, and it's something that, that Oculus and other people have started talking about as gaze cues. Uh, and I'm going to say that although uh, the horseman was generated and um, dynamically in the scene, that was in the Oculus Rift. So anyone who's tried the experience today has been trying it on the Gear VR, which is a mobile device. And you can't really get that quality of, of image through in, um, in real time on a mobile device. It's just a limitation of the, of the mobile VR platform. So we actually have a baked down version or a pre-rendered version of the experience that you've been going through. So there's actually one spot where the horseman appears and you can actually miss him in that one. So just so you all know. Uh, so yeah, that, that was how we created the story for Sleepy Hollow. Um, and it was a pretty big success at SDCC. There was lots of people uh, going through this covered bridge every day. Um, and since then we've continued to talk about narrative in VR and, and talk about how we're gonna t tell stories in VR. Um, and one thing that's come up very often, not just at our office, but in the VR community in general, is that presence is this linchpin of VR. And Steph actually mentioned it as well. Um, and but we've, what we've come to realize when we're talking about story, uh, presence is uh, part of the equation. And what's, what we're really talking about when we talk about presence is we're talking about immersion. Um, VR is the, the best medium we have right now to immerse you in an environment, and I think that's, that's that idea of presence. Uh, but we also get immersed in stories that we read or watch on television, um, and we can get immersed in games as well w by taking on the role of a hero. And those two elements are actually what we feel are the other uh, vectors that are involved in uh, VR storytelling. So we have presence, we have interaction, and we have narrative. Um, and these three vectors can inform and enhance each other, uh, but they're not intrinsically connected. You don't need all three. You can get away with one or two of them. Uh, so presence uh, is the, the idea of transporting the audience to a credible environment. Uh, and again, this is the idea of uh, 360 degrees of freedom. The audience can ignore your story, and it's a myth. So I want to ask you guys, quick show of hands, who thinks that this is a frameless 360 degrees experience? All right, there's one person that did it. This is awesome. Um, well, but what about this one? Does anyone know what this is? This is the Netflix lobby where you can watch Netflix in VR. So Netflix has built a living room for you to sit in and have presence in and watch content on a flat screen. And I mean, there's, there's literally, there's no difference between, between these, right? Um, and I mean, you do have a sense of presence in this environment, and uh, it's not acknowledged by anybody, and there's no one else there, but that's okay. It's fine. It's a pretty impressive living room. It's got a nice view. Um, so it's the same thing uh, when we watch TV in the real view, uh, world, uh, except my view is not as nice as that one. Uh, we're, but we're having a 3D 360 experience, and in fact, you guys are having a 3D 360 experience right now. <laughs> it's incredible. 
So the audience presence has no bearing on their, uh, on their experience. Uh, they're not compelled to look around their living rooms, uh, potentially missing any bits of story. Uh, they sit on their couches, uh, they watch television, they play games, and they're safe in the knowledge that nothing's going to jump out at them. So if anyone remembers that from Twin Peaks, frightening moment on television for a teenaged staff. So. <laughs> um, so here's another interesting IRL example of, uh, of a, a 360 3D experience, and that's surround sound. Um, designed, obviously, to make the audio experience of watching television a little bit more robust, uh, but I can guarantee you that neither of those two people are really caring about what's happening in that bowl of apples right now. So no one feels the need to look around when they're watching television and check what's happening on their mantle or in their kitchen, unless, obviously, there's something going on. Uh, and that's because there's a story being told in front of them. Uh, so surround sound and uh, other sort of like the 3D environment in VR, it augments that experience, but it's not necessarily needed for the story. What Presence does is it helps provide context. So in Sleepy, where we fill the environment with content that rewards the audience and um, is, is relevant to the story being told, uh, your presence provides further context. So the next thing is interaction. So that's allowing the audience to impact their experience. Um, because sometimes being there just isn't enough. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about how not having your presence acknowledged in a VR experience uh, makes us feel kind of dis disconnected. Uh, recently, Oculus Story Studio had an, a blog post where they talk about the Swayze effect, <laughs> which is uh, awfully coined after the movie Ghost, where Patrick Swayze uh, gets uh, riled up because he can't. Uh, he can't be acknowledged by anybody, he can't uh, uh, interact with anybody in the scene, in, his, in the world, because he is a ghost, because it's the movie ghost. <laughs> um, but the thing is that we're not acknowledged by our favorite TV shows, and yet we still get immersed in the story that's happening. So uh, there, there's no presence, but there's still immersion. Um, well, okay, sometime, sometimes we're, we're, there's breaking the fourth wall, and we get, we get addressed by the, the characters, and they address the audience. Um, but it's maybe something more like theater. So if you look at, um, there's a, an experience in New York City called um, Sleep No More, uh, where the audience wear these masks, and they follow actors around in a space that's been rented out, and the story actually uh, moves um, throughout this, this environment, and you have to decide which characters you're going to follow. You're kind of like a fly on the wall. Uh, and flies on the wall, they don't have their, their presence uh, acknowledged, so it's, that's pure presence. But what if you can interact? What if you can be acknowledged? Um, then what's happening is that you're, you're interacting with the space and you're being given some kind of agency. And there's def definitely different levels of agency uh, that can be given. So uh, directional tracking, which is the ability to move your head in 360 degrees, which is what most VR does. Uh, positional tracking, which is able to sort of move back and forth or like the HTC Vive in a larger area. And then there's the idea of improvised theater, uh, video games, and collaborative storytelling. So improv, uh, which is something that I'm an alumni of, uh, and what's interesting about improv is that uh, most people would think that the interaction that happens in improv theater is between the players on the stage and the audience uh, who are giving suggestions to the players. But what's actually happening is that there's an, there's a, uh, uh, an interaction, an emergent narrative that's happening between the players on the stage themselves. Because you're on stage, you've, you're setting a scene, and you can't communicate with the rest of the actors unless it's through your character. So nobody knows where the story is going. And the players try to put together a story knowing things like what a five-act structure is and so on. And the only reason that there's um, suggestions from the audience is that if a improv troupe is really good at what they do, no one would ever believe that it was improvised. So they get suggestions from the audience as proof. So if someone says, I need an object and I need a, a, a national landmark and they get bananas in the Eiffel Tower, then what you end up getting is a, a scene that is so intrinsically um, connected to the Eiffel Tower and bananas that at the end the audience says that couldn't have been any other suggestion that had to be done improv on the stage as we watched it. Uh, so obviously games are going to be a huge thing in VR. Um, uh, games provide us with goals and objectives. 
uh, and games. Video games have also always struggled with story, and that's not very any different in VR. Um, for instance, we've never actually seen a game that can do what a, a live tabletop role-playing game can do, like Dungeons & Dragons, where you have people sitting around a table and collaboratively world-building and uh, creating narrative, getting in, inv invested in their characters, and actually has a lot in common with both games and, and improv. Uh, and this is sort of where the idea of emergent narrative comes from. And so the idea of emergent narrative being that uh, on the far end of this graph uh, with the infinity symbol are any possible option that the players can take. The point of emergence is the one that they decide to do and then the story moves forward because there's no options needed, there's no branching narrative needed in an emergent narrative. I could talk about this forever and I have, uh, but it's definitely uh, the point of a, a, a much larger uh, presentation, can't fit it all in here. Uh, but the question that a lot of people always ask me is, how would we do this digitally? Um, and the real answer is, I'm not really sure, but uh, I'd love to find out. And for one example, I, I started looking into uh, Georges Poultry's uh, 36 dramatic situations. So what these are is he's boiled down um, every single possible dramatic si situation you could have into 36 of them, and that's not a very large number. And this is sort of how they're written. So rivalry of kin, you are required to have the preferred kinsman, the rejected kinsman, and the object of rivalry. And the object of rivalry uh, chooses the preferred kinsman over the rejected kinsman. And that's it. That's the dramatic situation. But you can write a story based on that. And if we can build these systems up, then eventually we can start building stories that are based on systems rather than on actual pre-generated pre uh, content. Uh, but that brings me back to narrative. Uh, so this is uh, what... I think is important in VR to, m to make the audience care, to have, to have that experience really resonate with somebody. Uh, so it brings us back to our original question, what is the secret to telling a good story in VR? Uh, and I guess my answer would just be to tell a good story. Uh, because if the story is good, it doesn't matter what medium you use. You can have books, film, television, radio. Um, there are stories that might be told better in one medium over another, uh, but the quality or merit is still rooted in drama and in characters and in plot, uh, and that the story has to resonate with the audience. So obviously in VR, and especially if we're going to start doing um, more real-time um, characters and not always the stereoscopic filming live, uh, we need to figure out how we can get resonance so that we can get the audience uh, to care about the outcome and uh, to empathize with the, the characters that they are involved with. Uh, again, this is something that, that video games struggle with a lot. It's very hard to do, especially uh, when uh, you're in the first-person point of view, like in the sleepy experience. Because when we see characters on screen, um, we can intuit how they feel, and we know how to act because we, we react to their emotions. So if someone feels terror in a screen or sadness, we understand what that is, and then we feel that emotion for them. It's not necessarily for us. We're completely aware that we're sitting in an audience. So when you have that in the first person point of view, we have less emotional cues and it becomes very difficult for us to know how to um, react or to how to feel. Uh, and in of often in games, this is where people just start to goof around because they don't, they don't feel the, the terror or they don't feel the emotion that they're supposed to. Uh, so obviously one thing that is really important um, to make this, this sort of resonance happen is to have uh, ca characters that seem real. Uh, not just from a written standpoint, uh, but also uh, they have to feel believable uh, in how they look. Uh, so uh, you might recognize uh, this person. This is uh, Kevin Spacey. Um, but, but you might also re recognize this other person, and this is actually not Kevin Spacey. Uh, this is actually a simulated approximation of Kevin Spacey, uh, but a pretty good one. Um, so on the uh, left side, we have Kevin Spacey, and on the right side, we have Sp Spacey-ish. So uh, it doesn't always have to be total realism. Stylized characters, uh, like those found in the game Journey, can still elicit powerful emotional reactions from an audience. Um, and that that kind of uh, art and story can be combined in the right style and, and put together some pretty amazing uh, pieces. This is Coloss. This is an, a really great uh, experience you can get on the cardboard. Uh, but the key thing to remember is that you need to avoid the uncanny valley because this is 100% this is nightmare fuel. And I'm really sorry 
uh, if there are any young children in the audience, uh, my bad. Um, um, the good news is uh, that you can avoid the Uncanny Valley, and we've gotten pretty good at this. Uh, we've gotten really good at sort of uh, creating CG that looks um, like uh, attractive. It may not necessarily be real, but it's, um, it's a cartoon version, uh, so we can skirt around the Uncanny Valley. But you have to be really careful not to fall in because, um, yeah, this is Pixar's uh, tin toy from 88. It's not, not very good. <laughs> CG. So we, at least we've gotten better at the base. So this is, this is much cuter than, than Terror, Terror Bot. Um, and part of that, uh, we've realized, is being able to capture uh, a performance. Um, so it's not just the CG model. It's actually an actor and actually emoting and having these tiny, um, t tiny uh, sort of emotions and, and, and micro, micro expressions happening, uh, which may not always get picked up, but, but the, the higher resolution our, our capture uh, gets, the better. Uh, so we learned a lot about stereoscopic capture and green screens when we were working on Sleepy. Actors need to be close to the camera. Shoot distance is what the distance you'll display. And unfortunately, uh, our project manager is, is a terrible actor. Uh, and quiet. Uh, you back? I can... All right. Oh, it's okay. He just says, you shouldn't be here wherever here is. And then... Look out behind you. <laughs> yeah. Th sorry. Thanks, Luke. Um, so, so this was this was literally our first test for uh, capturing stereoscopic on green screen, and we've constantly been pushing the, the limits of what we can do, uh, trying to develop new ways to capture performances. People may have heard of uh, light field cameras or plane optics, which is like a different way of capturing um, an image rather than being just a flat image. It creates a 3D model, a new one each frame, which is crazy heavy on animation. Uh, and then there's this sort of what we're doing right now, which is this hybrid approach where we're trying to do, this is actually a 3D model. You can actually move around this, uh, this person's head. Uh, that's, that's Haley. We call her digital Haley. Can just the uh, plan optics. It's the same thing. It, light field is plan optics. It's just different. It's like the science man terms for it. So it's Mr. Scientist. Um, yeah, so... Unfortunately, there's a lot of naysayers of uh, VR in the film and television community right now. Um, people who feel that VR is just about games. Uh, and, and to be perfectly honest, uh, I don't really blame them, um, but I do think it's a little bit short-sighted uh, because it's like comparing uh, the Lumiere brothers uh, to Star Wars. Uh, there's, uh, we're at like the very early stages of, of what storytelling is in VR, and it's obviously going to keep keep uh, uh, evolving. And there's actually some really good comparisons between uh, the nascent stages of VR and the nascent stages of film. Uh, early film was strictly uh, documentary. You had um, Lumiere Brothers, a train arriving at a, at, a, at a train station. This was literally one of the first pieces of film ever made. Not very riveting story. Um, and we've been doing the same thing in VR. There's a lot of 360, 3D uh, pieces that are uh, slices of life in documentary form or uh, journalism. Um, so back to train station, or, uh, train arriving at a station. It wasn't really until uh, the first cut was used uh, that uh, and, and cinematography was born uh, that we had the language to help tell a story on a screen. Uh, until then, it was just sort of like we're going to set up a camera, we're going to shoot what happens, and that's it. Uh, it, it was the, the invention of the cut, and then the invention of every other piece of language in cinematography that allowed us to be able to tell stories and allowed people to understand stuff. Um, so unfortunately, VR breaks that language, and we're going to need to discover it all over again. But I still think it's not really fair to say that VR isn't storytelling. Maybe not yet, when we're just out of the gate, uh, but we need to figure out new ideas for how to approach this. Uh, and, and I, for one, am super excited about rising to that challenge, and I'm really hoping that uh, everybody else is too. Uh, thanks very much. Okay, good. Uh, so it says it's very uh, uh, um, purple and dark there, but it says any questions. So if, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer them. Yes, in the front row.
Yeah. Yeah. So in the twenties I yeah, so so the co founder of Techstar is a Swedish developer. He has one foot on both worlds. Yeah, and for me it's like like especially in that case, it's like this is a guy who went through exactly what VR is going through now because he was creating CG movies and people were like, That's not gonna happen. And, and so, yeah, it, it's like, wow, how can you not see that this is the same thing? And now, I, I will say that uh, Ed Campbell did say um, he's, he's willing to be proven wrong. So, again, challenge accepted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can't say anything else other than, yeah, I totally agree that it's going to be the people who, who believe in the technology and want to work in it and want to push it. Yeah, okay, great. Go make another Titanic movie. It's fine. <laughs> Avatar 4. Uh, uh, yes. Um, optimal length for a VR piece? Um, it really depends. So Sleepy Hollow was at Comic-Con, so we, we had so many factors that we had to, to put into that, like lineups of people in the San Diego sun, um, how long it takes to get through the experience from one end to another, because the one thing you're not seeing here is that there was um, a photo taken of you on a green screen at the beginning, and then it, that was sort of um, uh, wirelessly uh, edited and put so that your decapitated head was on the screen at the end of the experience. So you get your photo taken, you get your head chopped off in VR, and then you can see your severed head. Uh, so at that, we were like uh, 90 seconds. That was our 90 second thing. I, I feel that people can go longer. I've done some experiences now that are longer games I've played that, that are longer. Um, so I don't know if there's really an optimum one. I really think it depends on the story that you want to tell. Yes. Right. So what kind of stories are good to tell in VR? Um, right now, I, I, I'm personally uh, struggling with uh, having stories that are told in multiple locations in, in like one VR episode because that, that transposing someone from one place to another is so disorienting that uh, like it's, it's hard to do the scene at the cop station and then the cops walk into the car and then the scene in the car and then the scene at the crime scene because there's so many cuts in between. You're constantly having to, as an audience, reorient where you are and ground yourself in that scene. Uh, so I'm, I'm experimenting with keeping things very simple and trying to stay like, what, what if we do something that's in one location and you, you watch an entire five minute episode in one location and then the next episode will take you somewhere else? Uh, yeah. So um, first person, obviously, like being addressed is something that a lot of people have tried. I'm trying to stay away from that to l figure out what it means to be a fly on the wall in a police procedural or something along those lines. I just want to, I want to know what that will be like. I think there's a lot of uh, potential for it. Anyone else? All right, cool, thank you.